good to be in church, isn't it? I like it. We were going, we were going through the prison epistles, right? Or we did. We went through Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. And many people, I believe, not everybody believes, but I believe probably two imprisonments for Paul, I think. So his first imprisonment was Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. He sends out those letters. Then it seems to me there's a little interval here between his final imprisonment and then his death, his martyrdom. And I believe it's during this little interval between imprisonments that he writes 1 Timothy and he writes Titus. But you wouldn't have to believe that. Some people think it's just one long imprisonment, and that'd be fine if that's what you thought. But beyond that, this letter, 1 Timothy, obviously the recipient then is Timothy, written around AD 65. 1 Timothy, whether you believe Paul's writing from jail or during a little interval of freedom, Paul's focus is on the local church and how it should run and operate. And I think it makes good sense because Paul has an idea, although he says he wants to return to see people, I think he has a good sense that his days are numbered. And so his mind is going towards young Timothy and Timothy being ready to fulfill his calling. His mind's going towards the roles of bishops and deacons and how they should lead churches. So really, this book is very, very helpful for a church like ours and every church in existence today. How to run a church. We find important things. A key verse might be 1 Timothy 3.15, and you know it's a verse that I always quote and love. But here we are in the book, so let's read it. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He, that verse, I think, is key for this book. And as you know, I always preach, I think that verse is key for understanding a lot of things. It, it's key for knocking down the idea that the universal church is it, right? The body of Christ is it. Because it's just not true. The, if we're all saved and automatically you're in the body of Christ, praise the Lord. You're at the assembly of the saints, names written in heaven, praise the Lord. But don't ever use that as a reason to forsake a local assembly. Because we see here, it couldn't be worded more clearly or more um, profoundly the local church, we know it's the local church because he's saying how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And the whole context before this is talking about the roles of leaders in the house of God. So we know it's talking about a local church. And then it puts the significance of the local church as being the pillar and ground of the truth. That, for me as a young man, was enough for me to be convinced that the local church is important. Whatever church I was in, I was growing up, I was in my old church. Whatever church I'm in, I realize that is the pillar and ground of the truth, from, where, from which the truth is supposed to spring and from which it does spring. So I purposed in my heart as a young man that I was never going to jump out of local churches. I was always going to be center my life on local churches. And I do think that's a biblical pattern for lives. But let's read the book. Let's start here in uh, chapter 1 and... Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. I believe he led, I believe he led Timothy directly to the Lord. Uh, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. A big part of 1 Timothy is Paul sets up the church and he also encourages Timothy to don't switch doctrines. Don't bring in false doctrines. To be careful about doctrine. I think you can learn from this book that yes, the local church is important and yes, doctrine is important. Local churches that don't have an eye for doctrine or a care for doctrine, and instead they say our mission is simply to preach Jesus, they often are failing to do just that because they're not defending doctrines around Christ. They're not defending doctrines that are central to someone coming to the Lord. 
doctrines about sin, doctrines about hell, doctrine about the holiness of Christ, the deity of Christ, right? Christians and good churches have to center themselves on good doctrine and be careful to never depart from it. Uh, a church that changes doctrine must be done very, I think, prayerfully, carefully, and orderly if you plan to change doctrine. It says here, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. He opens this this charge to Timothy, talking about the dangers of false doctrine. Yeah, but what leads churches astray often, he says, giving heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. We're called as Christians to bring forward things that edify, are we not? Share things that edify rather than godly edifying, which is in the face to do. Everything the church does and everything we do as Christians should be looked at through that lens. Does this topic, does this doctrine, does it build somebody up? Does it defend Christ? Or is it simply just a hobby horse that we like because we like it? And it's okay to have hobbies and hobby horses, but there's really not a place for them in church work, in ministry. I've got some examples. In fact, I'm going to go off on a long bunny trail about um, fables and questions and strife that really do not edify whatsoever. And I think it's merited because he's warning Timothy about these things. Please look at five. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Our goal is, as a local church, as Christians, is to preach out of charity. We know that powerful word. We covered it a couple weeks ago, or last week, I can't remember. And I like these words, out of a pure heart. It makes sense to me that you have pure intentions when you come to God's work. You know that? Your intentions are pure. Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, it isn't to get rich and famous or to make people like us or to make people hate us. We're doing it because we simply want to share the Word of God. Pure intentions. When you share the gospel with people, sometimes it's a good check. Or when you share truth with people, sometimes it's a good check for yourself. I'm about to impart the gospel. I'm about to impart a doctrine. Well, what's my goal? Is it to make myself sound smart or superior? Or is my goal to simply depress them and hope that they never get right on the topic if they need to get right? No, the, the intention you need to have is to... Glorify God, and your intention should also be hoping that they come to the truth. I think it should always be there. A good conscience, it says there, and of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned. Unfeigned, that means sincere faith. He wants this to be a real church, you know that? He wants Timothy's churches to be real, not fake. Just sincere in their beliefs. Well, the church that I grew up in, I loved for a time there, we had it as a, like a mantra. Be real. And I liked it. I liked it. It's like there's no reason for facades in our personal lives. There's no reason for facades in our ministry. Let's be real. And if there are parts of our realness that aren't edifying, then let's get rid of that part, okay? Being real doesn't mean accepting the parts that aren't edifying. Being real means not, uh, not faking, not putting on airs. All right, look at verse 6. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. Instead of preaching sound doctrine, things that edify, things that are sincere, we turn into fables, we, we turn to questions, we turn to vain jangling. And I want to touch on this vain jangling for a second. Um, because I think this is where good churches can get off today. Like good churches. I mean churches that have a pretty good doctrinal statement and they stand on the right things. But all of the topics in our world today with this information world we have where you can watch any topic on YouTube in 10 seconds and you see all these things across your social media. You see all, this, all these news stations, 24-hour news cycles. And there's so many things swirling. And Christians, I believe many of us, are taking these swirling things and we're adding them into our ministries and they're coming out like vain janglings. And then we wonder why people aren't growing, uh, why people aren't sound in the faith. 
Jangling means sounding discordantly. So not a chord, right? Like this, like a... The main jangling is... So... It's beautiful, but it comes across, uh, I don't know, just off. Like, why are we talking about this? Those, those notes don't line up together. They don't point back to the Bible. They don't point forward to the cross. They're out of place. Vain jangling. I want to give some examples. Uh, because I think I've been guilty of this. Maybe you would admit you've been guilty too. But I think many churches, and I think our church might be guilty of getting off into vain jangling. Um, this is a long hobby horse. In fact, we might not get back to it, so bear with me. A long bunny trail, I should say. We're ambassadors of the gospel, amen? We deliver a very clear letter, the Bible, to the world. So we should not confuse our message of the gospel with vein janglings, including political viewpoints, right? I am a conservative. I, I have conservative principles. I vote conservative people. But that is not my message, I don't spend my time touting Trump. I don't even spend my time touting Reagan, and I like Reagan, right? I, I, like, I like them. I don't spend my time touting free markets, although I believe in free markets. It's just not my calling. And I think it's fine if, if I want to talk over coffee with someone about that thing, but it's not at all part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I think churches are sometimes missing this, and we think that we've got to get in the political fight. Well, I'm not say, I'm saying vote. I'm saying tell people to vote. Good. That's fine. But it's still not ministry. And what will absolutely impact our world is you sharing someone truth from the Bible, not some truth you heard from PragerU or Shapiro or somebody like that, right? Uh, no matter how clever it may be. How about vain janglings being speculative theories, just theories that you hear? These are vain janglings. Uh, the QAnon stuff, right? Everybody seen that? The new um, theories. You see so many theories popping up with vaccines and, and, and the mark of the beast, right? And I think you know what I believe about vaccines, but we think everything's the mark of the beast, right? And we know from studying Revelation that there, a lot of things have to happen, okay? before the mark of the beast comes and we're bowing down to worship the beast by taking the mark, okay? We'll see some more signs. How about people getting off on moon landing denial? This one is important. I usually take people straight from moon landing denial right to John 3.16. And I see the connection there and it touches their heart, the fact that we did or we didn't or land on the moon. I want to name a bunch of things here, and there, I, I say there may be some merit somewhere to some of this, but it is all extra-biblical. We'll talk about later in Timothy anti-biblical things. What we're talking about right now, and I'm connected to vain jangling, is extra-biblical. What good does it do people for you to dig into this theory and then spout the theory to the world? What good does it do? The flat earth theory. Christians are getting into the flat earth theory. I don't think it's of God. It's not worth our time to study, nor is it worth our words to speak, because it does not edify. 9-11 conspiracies, right? Those used to be a lot more popular than they are now, but those, those, I know Christians who got caught up in those theories for years, and it's what they studied. And I'm trying to study a little bit of Bible, and they, I don't know if they got extra time to study. UFO sightings, I don't know, Bigfoot sightings, Loch Ness Monster sightings, that kind of theories, right? We could all get off into theories, speculative theories. I think they're vain janglings. How about predictions? And this one I want to spend some time on. Predictions. Remember Matthew 24, 36? Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Christ said about the return of Christ. It says, No man knows the day or the hour. What do Christians, though, do? We look for the year. Well, what year is it then? <laughs> what month? Okay, they didn't say, you said day or hour. I can still find the month. You can find the year. Well, do you know how much time you can spend on chasing these predictions? They're vain janglings. 
Let me read some because I just it, w it was kind of uh, shocking to me because sometimes I just rattle off a list of predictions. But really, the, the list of Christ coming back and the world predictions is an annual occurrence. If you get on YouTube, there is always something for you to see that says, this is it, this is it. Sadly, this topic, I think, spans the spectrum from young Christian to old Christian. It's like a, it's a virus. It's this thing of knowledge increases and there's just too much going on and we need to get our eyes back on the Bible. I don't care how enticing the YouTube video is. I'm sad to say that I've seen Christians, I've seen ministers bring in YouTube videos to church services, right? All kinds of that people's lives are hanging by a thread, right? My life, many times, is hanging by a thread. I need the Word of God. I need, I need to be told to get out of sin, reminded, right? I need to be told how to live my life. But here we're going to watch a YouTube video. I think it destroys things. The 19, <laughs> Harold Camping, anybody know Harold Camping? That guy's a straight shooter. He predicted the end of the world in 1994. And then he predicted it in 1995. <laughs> and then he predicted it in 2011. He's got a pretty good track record so far. <laughs> He's not the only one that many people do. Well, I'm just going to name some big ones here. Do anybody remember living in the 90s? I was a 90s kid. 1999 was Nostradamus' big end of world. Anybody remember that? I remember hearing about that. I remember hearing about that in church settings. Well, Nostradamus said this. Okay, well, what did Paul the Apostle say? Or Peter, or Jesus? Let's talk about them. When do we invite in these non-believers to be in our heads? How about 2000, right? The big Y2K crash. Impacted a lot of church budgets. I'm not knocking my church. I'm not trying to be mean at all, but... We invited our church, and I'm sorry if you've come from that church, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I love the church. I love my upbringing. But I'm telling you, this stuff didn't help me. <laughs> in 2000, we invited a speaker into our church who was a Y2K expert, right? I, we had never had someone in our church give a, a speech on something extra biblical before, but for that we did. I don't know why. We filled our basement with food. For the Y2K crash in 2000. 2007, Pat Robertson said it was going to be the final judgment. Pat Robertson got it wrong. I'm sorry, Pat. 2012. What was 2012? Mayan calendar. Yeah, I, I've always got all my sound doctrine from the Mayan people. That's where I get my stuff, right? It's just amazing. That, we, that we're all about the Bible all the time and we'd never let anything impact us. But if someone says, oh, it's the end of the world, we say, okay, that's the judgment coming. There it is. There's the date. There, connect the dots. How about 2014 and 2015? There was these things called blood moons. Anybody hear that? John Hagee was big on the blood moons. Preppers went wild with the blood moons. Talk about looking for signs in the heavens. <laughs> We will see some signs in the heavens, but we're not going to know years. And it's not supposed to impact our lives anyways. We're just going to occupy until he comes. We're going to redeem the time. In 2015 was that big word, uh, Shemitah. Shemitah cycles, the Jewish cycles. This one's new for some of you. It was big when my upbringing, well, not upbringing at this point, but... The rabbi, Jonathan Kahn, talked about the Shemitah cycles. Ms. Cowden heard it before? Maybe not. So, sold a lot of books about the Shemitah cycles, but they still haven't come true. In 2017, that planet, that large planetary object, object Nibiru, Nibiru, you know this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, right there. Nibiru was supposed to collide and destroy the earth. In 2020, Jeannie Dixon, another straight shooter, Jeannie Dixon said 2020 was the last year. She also said 1962 was going to be the last year. You just ought to keep guessing. If I keep guessing every year, I'm going to get it right eventually, and then you're all going to have to pay me a lot of money because I'm a prophet. <laughs> Why do I say these things? I say these things not to, not to pick on people, but I say these things because I want to say something clearly. I think we need to stop watching YouTube. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we need to stop watching YouTube. 
I've seen it in Christians' lives. I've seen, I know men, and I'm not going to name names, but I know men that used to, on their lunch breaks, open up their New Testaments and sit down and read their little New Testament, their little pocket New Testament on their lunch breaks. You know what now those men do? On their lunch breaks, they pull out their cell phone and they watch YouTube videos. And I can see a, a, a direct correlation between less Bible reading means walking further away from God. Their spirituality going downhill. And those, I have people that text me. I would much rather, some people text me Bible verses. Some people text me YouTube videos. I always respond to the Bible verses. I never respond to the YouTube videos. It's kind of my rule. I don't know what to say. Uh, cool. <laughs> Interesting. This, yeah, this might be the one. The other 100 were wrong, but this might be the one. I don't know how to respond to it. But I know absolutely it's impacting Christians' walk with the Lord. Because I know if I... Okay, on Saturday, I tried to do a whole bunch of Bob Reed and get prepared for Sunday. I replaced it with YouTube. There'd be nothing coming out of this pulpit. I could tell you a lot of hearsay and vain jangling is all I could tell you. My life would be a mess, my heart would be a mess, and I'm afraid that then it would bleed down into the congregation. We don't, Christians never do this. Christians, we know our Bibles. We, we never treat unbelievers, YouTube personalities, rabbis, Pentecostals, and creeps like they're worth listening to. Unless they start mentioning things about the end of the world, then we think, oh, this is biblical. No, it's still unbiblical. We know the end of the world will come, but we'll just follow the Bible signs and seasons. This is it. And the nice thing about reading the Bible and looking for the signs and the seasons, um, as you're reading, you'll see a bunch of good things that are good for you too. Yeah, the problem is that there's always an end to your prediction. And one day, the predictor will get it right. Just out of... Just out of, what do you call it, mathematics. <laughs> Pick every one, you eventually get it right. But the problem is, in the meantime, we've wasted our lives. Wasted our lives. You know the span I just talked about there? And I'll tell you, so for my life, so, you know, in the 90s I was pretty young, so who knows what I was doing then, who knows. But from 2000 on to 2017, that's 17 years of significant portion of my life as an older person. I could have spent those 17 years chasing theories, prepping like crazy, and I would have wasted my life. Please look at Matthew chapter 25. Uh, I think it's relevant to us because tonight we might hear a theory that sets our, heart, our, our hair on fire and we're like, this is it. Head for the hills. How about the idea of false flags? Every time there's, a, there's an election, oh, this is the end of it, this is it. Martial law is coming right now, and then the, the, the guys with the blue helmets are going to be outside my front door. One day things might get bad, but if we keep looking at all this stuff like Chicken Little, we, we will waste our lives. Look at Matthew 25, please, and I look at verse 13. I think it's needful that I preach this because my own heart, I told you before, I'm a, I'm a worry wart. I'm a nervous kind of person. I think about things and I want to be ahead of things, right? Good morning. Nice to see you, Ron. Anywhere you want to sit. Yeah, Bible's back there if you want one. I just came to shake your hand, bro. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's for the word. Uh, Romans 12, too. Nice to see you. Okay. I got Okay, take care. Okay. We'll see you. That's Ron. Matthew, we're in Matthew 25, verse 13. Never know what's going to happen in Truth Baptist Church. I'm just glad that the last person that came in the middle of the service, they had a bag and they were fishing in the bag, and that scared me. <laughs> Yeah, and they threw a tinfoil ball at me. I ever tell you guys, it's a whole different story, yeah. No, we got really significantly scared and legitimately scared. A man, it was during the, all the coronavirus stuff, and a man came in, of course with a mask, because everyone's got a mask. But he comes in, and he's like pacing back and forth. Won't answer my questions. Like, hey, how's it going? Just like I did with Ron. 
And uh, then he puts down a bag in the pew back there. And he starts digging through this bag, and all the guys, Emerson's ready to draw, Pat's ready to draw. And I don't blame him. I was thinking the same thing. So he's digging there, he finally pulls out a paper. Oh, but before, before that, he said he had the, the nice words of saying, Who's the pastor? <laughs> like, Pat, Pat. <laughs> We just ordained him. He's been called of God. Church confirmed. He's your man. <laughs> no, he dug. He pulled out a paper. He, he put it up here. And the paper said he was mad at the church before us about something. So, <laughs> but then he goes out. We watch him go out. But then he comes running back out of his car with a, with a ball, a tin foil ball. And he throws it. And he hands the ball. hands the ball to me. And I just take it. Yeah, he wanted to come and throw it at me. I took it out there, I grabbed it, then I dropped it. Tinfoil ball, thinking bomb. And his letter said, a cryptic letter said, I'm going to throw truth bombs, throwing truth bombs, okay? So I called the cops. But anyway, long story short, short you know what, uh, <laughs> you know what I learned from all this stuff right here? People need the Bible. <laughs> Even though I'm sorry that the, the moment right there is... Yeah, I won't say it because I think everybody listens to YouTube sermons and stuff. I, I am on YouTube too. Here I am, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> I'm a hypocrite. But, uh, but people aren't just listening to sermons on YouTube. And I, I think we see a case in point there. Okay. We need to get in our Bibles, not less. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for we know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Okay. Talking about the, when he's second coming. Look at 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And then to the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. All these people have been given talents. Look at 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. That man redeemed the time. He used what God had given him for the full, uh, the full amount of God's glory. Everything God gave him, he gave back to God. Right? In verse 16. 17. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Um, in this verse, in the Greek it says, in verse 18, And this person went and built a, a hideout shelter in Weipe and hid everything he had. I think our world today, how you apply that is people... Knowing that God's going to come back, um, but then living in a way that is self-preserving, right? Worried about self-preservation. Instead of using what God gives us, we take it and we hide, right? We hide our families. You protect your family, but uh, you hide. You don't use your voice. You don't speak much at all. You live a very quiet life, hidden somewhere, out of the limelight, because you know the more they know about you, the more you're going to get caught. It's just not the way Christians have lived at any time ever. Christians are never, go, are never called to go into um, hiding when it's just discord. I mean, it's, if they're chasing like you're a Jew or something, go ahead and hide. <laughs> but our job is to redeem the time. To live a life hiding, bunkering down for Y2K all the way up to Nibiru is to hide what God has given you and not use it for His glory. I, I think it's important. I'm not saying it well, but I'm just saying we can waste our lives. Give your life to the Lord. Look, it says, 19, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Whatever God gives you, the resources He gives you, the talent He gives you, the energy He gives you, the time He gives you, He gives it expecting a return on what He's given. And this whole thing I'm talking about today, this mentality is distracting us from doing just that. 22, he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. These are people who saw what God gave and they went off and they used it. And to my point of upbringing, when I was young, I would always heard things about, you know, which one of you boys is going to be a missionary? Which one of you boys is going to be a pastor, a preacher? 
you know, girls, what are you going to do with your lives for the Lord? Who are you going to marry? How are you going to serve God? But when we were listening to the Y2K guy, the Niburu guy, the Shemitah guy, it was, boys and girls, how are you going to prep? Took my mind, and I'm sure it took other people's mind, completely off of what God might be calling them to do on their lives. 23. And how do I know it was wrong? Well, Y2K was the year 2000. And when we sang, Should all acquaintance be forgotten? And we flipped the calendar, nothing happened. I know it was wrong. 23, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. There thou hast that is thine. Look at God's response to this wasted life of hiding. 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. God gives us so much. When we trust Christ as our Savior, He gives us the, the down payment with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we take this powerful thing, the Holy Ghost, in our lives that can give us words to speak, give us comfort through trial, all these wonderful things. And we take that Holy Spirit, we say, Holy Spirit, you need to hide in the hills with me because God ain't strong enough, right? And we're done working. Stop the clock. God expects us to use what he's given. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, it gets pretty stiff there at the end about what kind of life that is. I think this is important, church, because you know what Idaho is? One of the safest places to live in America. And you know what the migration we have to Idaho? A whole bunch of people, and some very well may be saved, but they come with this huge portion in their head that it's time to hide. But no, it's still time to share the gospel. It's still time to serve the Lord. It's still time to serve in a local church, like he tells Timothy. We, we got five minutes. I was going to go to um, Psalm 37. You say, Logan, to combat vain jangling, you just did a bunch of vain jangling. Oh, I hope not. Psalm 37. If we ever wonder how are we to get by, we should simply open our Bibles and understand that how Christians have gotten by has never been by their preparation. Never been by their preparation. The, the big example people will point to is Joseph. Joseph. Right? Saving the Egyptian people. They saved up some food and helped them through a famine. Well, all that was not about saving Joseph. It was all about showing God through it all. Right? Joseph was simply doing it, and the world was the beneficiaries of it. But talk about taking that and building a principle. <laughs> It's, it's not sound doctrine. Throughout Psalms, we have so many mentions of just trust God, don't trust your own strength. Just trust God, don't trust your own bank account. Just trust God, don't trust your horses. And I don't even have horses. All right? Wish I did have a horse. Psalm 37, look at a few of these verses, please. Three, trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. That's a promise. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God wants us trusting him with our lives. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness, righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Watch another YouTube video so you get yourself stressed out. Fret, that wasn't in there. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We're supposed to rest in the Lord. That only happens when you open your New Testament on your lunch break. 
Look at verse 11, please. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. That's still a promise. We should be pursuing meekness. And then God says, we'll inherit the earth. Look at verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. A little. Take your little and God will preserve you with the little. You'll be just fine if you trust in the Lord. 17. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. You say, Logan, you preach all this to tell us to trust God. But what if you are wrong? What if you are wrong? And calamity does happen tomorrow, and you just cause Pat not to go buy 700 pounds of beans. Well, Pat, I'm going to have to issue an apology. <laughs> I'm sorry. But what if you told someone in 2000 that they need to hunker down and dig in, and here it is 2021. Well, I'm sorry. They would need to issue a mighty larger apology. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and the days of famine. They shall be satisfied. Uh, I know the Bible. I know the Bible says famines come. But look right there. That verse also in the Bible says, In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into the smoke, and into the smoke, smoke shall they consume away. I don't know how you'll be satisfied, but God says you will be. Same way, I don't know how God's going to supply all your needs, but God says he will. I don't know. Look at verse 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they, they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. We're out of time. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. We can take all this vain jangling, and we can chuck it, because we have God to trust in. Amen? The world, uh, the world without God, maybe they do need to prep a bunch. But we, we got God. We've got God. So we don't need to run around like chickens with our head cut off every time we see something on YouTube. In fact, we might just want to shut it off. All right. That's it. I told you that was a long bunny trail. Next time we come back, I think we'll look at vain jangling in the context of things that are anti-biblical, not necessarily extra-biblical. We got a minute. Anybody got any comments or questions? Or You don't need to get rid of all your guns, Donald. I'm not saying that. Everything in moderation, right? Right? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the Bible. Because, Lord, you know my heart. If I had my way, I would be off this morning prepping somewhere for some calamity. But, Lord, you call my heart, and your word directs my steps. And when you direct me, Lord, you always bring me back to ministry, and you always bring me back to glorifying your son's name. You always bring me back to sharing the gospel, Lord. And may that be our church, that we never get off on vain jangling, but we are here to edify and to minister. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.